I wanted to uh, introduce Gary to you uh, from Singularity University, and he's actually, he's, he's very much an expert in this space and has done a lot of speaking on it. Um, internationally recognized, he focuses on strategies for helping individuals, organizations, communities, and countries to thrive in the transition to a digital work economy. He's Singularity's chair for the future of work. He leads the organization's efforts to empower a global community with the mindset, skill set, and network to create an abundant future of work and learning. In the seismic transition to what Gary calls the digital work economy, individuals, organizations, communities, and countries all need to develop a shared understanding of the dynamics of disruptive change. They need to collaborate on the development of effective strategies, and they need to ensure that all people have access to meaningful work and lifelong learning opportunities. Last time I talked to Gary, I think he was in Europe. Um, he's usually traveling all over the place. Um, we're grateful that he's decided to spend some time with us here in the Midwest. He said that his uh, secret to the time zone change is to just never really pay attention to it and always just kind of keep moving forward. Um, but if you've noticed, he's, he's worked with such clients as Google, Intel, New Zealand, government, the United Nations, which explains his international travel, uh, as well as his domestic travel. And among the many conferences that he started and the groups that he started, one that's close to my heart is one um, that's centered around impact investing, actually, um, that grows out of my background in social entrepreneurship. So I'm um, very grateful to have Gary here with us today and very grateful for his, uh, his time, his expertise, and what he's about to share with you. So without further ado, Gary. Thank you so much. Thank you. You have a chair. Oh, OK, all right. Uh, yeah, but I have a lot of nervous energy, so I don't think the chair is going to get much use, but we'll see. Good afternoon. That's not going to do. Good afternoon. Okay, this is interactive. You know, we're going to try to make this dialogue as much as possible. Uh, I've got a bunch of, um, we call it speed dating with ideas. I've got a bunch of thoughts that I want to give you, but um, I want to thank uh, Melissa and Ray and the team for inviting me here. Um, uh, I've never, this is my first trip to South Bend, and uh, I've I'm sure you figured it out by Did you know there's a football team here? <laughs> there's, yeah, just, and, but, but what's weird is I just came, I was in, I spent a week in, in France. Um, I just spent a month in Europe lecturing, but a week in France. And they, they have something there spelled the same as the campus here, but they pronounce it differently as if it was French or something. I don't know. So, so anyway, so, so go figure. That's what we get for traveling around the world. All right, so um, uh, what are we going to talk about today? You've had a great range of perspectives from what some of these uh, community innovators that we call mayors are focusing on. You've got some perspective on the role of ethics and empathy. Um, I want to step back a little bit and talk about some of the trends and changes uh, that we see and, um, and help you maybe see some of the, the threads that we see coming together, especially around the future of work, future of learning. And then um, how do we prioritize? How do we think about how we can be working together? Why do we sort of focus on what we think some of those uh, major changes need to be? And um, uh, of course, we have to start off talking about, uh, where do we go? Yeah, technology. <laughs> so this is actually in Oslo Airport uh, last week. It's an amazing uh, event uh, called the Oslo Freedom Forum. And I, I love the simplicity of this. They're not trying to sell any one thing. It's just technology. So let's talk about technology, uh, especially robots. Have, have you seen enough robot videos? Let's, let's just see one more. OK, so, so what, this, is, this is normally, um, I'll tell you a little about Singularity University in just a second. But this is normally the period where of the, uh, the talk where we, we, we call the shock and awe part. So normally I would want to stun you with a range of technology leaps forward that are having a massive impact on the innovation space, but not quite visible yet to us and, and, and why that's true. So um, I'm not going to, I don't want to belabor it too much. I'll just tell you a couple of, of quick examples of technologies. So um, uh, we're, we're, at a, we're at a period where the things that we thought of as science fiction 
we now are making science fact very, very quickly. But if there's one that stands out, uh, there's an amazing woman by the name of Mary Lou Jepsen. She's a former executive at Google, Facebook, but she has a company called Open Water. And what Mary Lou has done is she has created a device that's about the size of a video cassette. Has anybody in the audience seen a video cassette before? <laughs> I'm just trying to get the age level of the audience. You know, my, my son's 23, he's actually here at the event, and you know, for his, his age group, it's video cassette? Is it you know, something you would stick into a device and play a tape? It just sounds so, so last year. So, um, so about the size of a video cassette, and what she thinks that she can do is using infrared technology, she can s develop a scan. This is actually a device that you would have within your home within five years that can scan the human body at a resolution one billion times better than an x-ray. One billion with a book, creating a three-dimensional color model of what's going on inside your body that you could see any time that you wanted, completely non-invasively. But that's not the crazy part. Mary Lou thinks that she can take that device and she can hook it up to a skull cap and she can read the human mind. So why does she think she can do that? If you look online, you'll see that at Harvard, actually, there was a study that was done, took a bunch of grad students, stuck them in an MRI machine, showed them a video of a train, a video of an elephant, and had an, in, uh, some artificial intelligence software watching what the neural patterns was, where, where, the, where the different uh, neurons were firing in the brain. This is with the poor resolution of an MRI. And then they put the students back in, showed them the same videos, but did not tell the AI software what they were looking at. The AI software had to create images that it thought they were looking at. Now, it's not exactly like a train. It's not exactly like an elephant, but it's kind of train-ish and elephant-ish. And that's just with the poor resolution of that MRI machine. So imagine how this is going to transform industry after industry, psychology, what's going to happen when you can actually see what's going on inside the brain of a young child and, and see if the prefrontal cortex is not developing at an appropriate rate. Well, that might be a future axe murderer. So you've got to train that kid totally differently. Imagine how this is going to transform education to know that you actually learned something, to see that you were able to retain something. Imagine how this is going to transform relationships. You know, you, you say to your spouse, you know, I don't think you really like my mother. Put on the skull cap. I want, okay, that's not a good idea, but I think Generally, think of that as one example of dozens and dozens of technologies that are on the cusp that are going to be just as fundamental and as impactful as these digital distraction machines, which we've only had for 10 years. So think of how half a billion people on the planet got these things in a blindingly short period of time and it transformed their worlds. Think of how half the people on the planet are going to come online in the next 10 years who are not already online using these devices and how transformative they've been. Now expand that into, multiply that by technology after technology in different arenas. Well, that's what Singularity University is focused on. So I'm the chair for the future of work. This is a think tank that is based in Mountain View, California. Uh, it's neither about the singularity nor is it a university. So we have an identity problem that we're, I promise we're working on really, really hard. It's not a university because we can't get accredited. Uh, the it, state of California with uh, WASC you know, requires you basically to pour glue over your curriculum for about two years to be able to get accredited. We change our curriculum every two weeks, constantly. Um, and it's not about the singularity because even though Ray Kurzweil wrote the book The Singularity is Near is one of our co-founders. Uh, the other co-founder is Peter Diamandis who wrote the a book on abundance. Uh, because the singularity is this sort of mythical period where one microprocessor, one computer is kind of smarter than a human being. Um, that, that is a raging debate as to whether or not that even matters, you know, whether a computer would even think, quote unquote, the way that a human does. Instead, what singularity really is focused on is exponential technologies. And I'll explain that in just a second. But basically, the premise is that there's all these different technologies that are having a huge impact in our world. And it's not that just each of them individually is having an impact. It's that they are accelerating each other. And so if you take a half a dozen of these technologies like artificial intelligence, uh, which we really should be calling machine learning, uh, next generation robotics, and uh, next generation computing, you take those technologies together, you get a science fiction level technology like self-driving cars and trucks. Um, and as Chris was saying, this, this, this is a technology that 10 years ago in Silicon Valley, 
people maintained we were never going to be able to crack the code on this. And so it's because these different technologies are all accelerating each other because we're essentially piling on one on top of the other and use, have, innovators are leveraging each other, standing on the shoulders of giants at a blinding speed. That's why you get this rapid pace of change. And so why, why do we call it exponential? Well, um, uh, you know, I, I write a lot about the future of work. I also talk about the future of learning. Uh, I have absolutely no moral standing in that arena because I, I actually never graduated from college. I never really attended college. But my memory from my you know, long distant high school days is that uh, if you, I was never very good at math, but if you basically say, if I take 30 steps, one meter at a time, by the time I've gone 30 steps, I have gone, simple math, 30 meters, I would hope. But if I double it every time, one meters, two meters, four meters, eight meters, by the time I've gone 30 steps, I've gone a billion meters, I've gone around the planet 26 times. And what happens with exponential change is always the same curve. That is, at the beginning, it looks like nothing is happening. There's a whole bunch of innovation that's going on at the bottom, under the current, we don't know, under the radar. And then what happens is, oh, we start to hear, well, this self-driving car thing, what's, what's going on with that? And then suddenly you see them everywhere. I've literally been on a highway in Silicon Valley, had a self-driving car on both sides of me. And so this is the path of exponential change. So all of these advances that we think of as being baked into our modern, modern life, they actually are in that exponential curve. Ray, Ray Kurzweil has actually plotted this, not just for microprocessors, but for a range of different technologies. And it turns out they always follow this curve. So, and you are here. You're right here. This is probably the slowest day of the rest of your life. It's only going to accelerate. All right, so, so does that mean we can follow the patterns and strategies of the past? Probably not. There, there's lots of things we can learn from the past, lots of things we can try to extend, but we probably need to be thinking about how we get a bigger boat. What are the strategies that are gonna help us to be able to adapt to this exponential curve? And as, as uh, the, uh, the author, uh, science fiction author uh, William Gibson is fond of saying, what happens so much in our world is that we see technologies over here, technologies over there, technologies over there. The, te the future is already here. We already are creating these science fiction level products our challenge is that it's not evenly distributed. That is, it appears in different places and different people have it, and it isn't evenly distributed. And so what ends up happening is people have cognitive dissonance because we were not trained to be able to deal with all of this different change so fast. You know, we, we were sort of optimized for that hunter period that Chris from West Sacramento was talking about. That's, you know, we, 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 our senses were really designed to be able to determine, is, is, is that my lunch on the horizon or am I its lunch? And then try to make the right decision. And so, so we're, we're, we're actually, we're not designed to hurdle down a highway at 90 miles an hour and to be able to suddenly be able to figure out what's going on. And so, because technology is not evenly distributed, because we as humans are not actually designed for this pace of change, we've got to come up with some different ways to be able to adapt our institutions. So, but the truth is, we can look back at the past a little bit and we can learn from it. Uh, and I, I think this was sort of the point that Chris was making, is we, we went from hunters to uh, gatherers, <laughs> agriculture, uh, and then we went through this transition to, to what we called the industrial era. And depending upon the country you were in, it took from you know 60 to 90 years, went through a series of different phases, but basically we invented a whole bunch of things. We have invented uh, high schools, we invented corporations, we invented the production line, we invented a whole bunch of things to be able to, as humans, to be able to adapt to a new model. And, uh, and so, so what happened at that time, this is uh, New York in 1900. What do you see? You see uh, semi-autonomous technology. They're called horses. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, I mean, you could fall asleep and nothing bad would really happen. Um, so, so and, and 13 years later, this is New York. It's all Model Ts. So, so we've been through these kinds of transitions where technology at a very, very rapid pace has been adopted. The, have we learned how to do that effectively and efficiently? No, what we end up normally doing as humans is the innovator does it and then we adapt, we respond. You know, um, Steve Jobs didn't stand on a stage 10 years ago when he announced the iPhone. It's not an iPhone, it's a Galaxy, but you get the idea. Um, he didn't say, I am gonna ruin human conversation. 
I'm going to make it so the teenagers go to bed at night with lots of friends and they wake up in the morning with none because they, all the friends uh, shun them on social media. I'm going to make it so that families will sit around at our Singularity University Summit last year in the lobby. There was a family of six, six, sitting around all on their cell phones together. So he didn't say any of those things, but they all became true. And so what we do is we are trying to adapt to these technologies long after they've actually had a really pivotal impact on our societies. And so I think that's one of our opportunities when we start talking about the future of work is we aren't necessarily going to be able to predict all the dynamics, but we can certainly look at the way humans sort of think and work and we can make some intelligent decisions. So this is why I call it a digital work economy is uh, we're going through what I think is just as pivotal a transition uh, as the transition from agricultural to industrial economies, but it's happening in a blindingly short period of time. And because the future is not evenly distributed, it's happening in a variety of different ways in different places, but there are some similarities and there are ways that we can start to think about the strategies that we follow and the ways that we can collaborate on those. But as I think uh, Chris was saying earlier in his talk is we, well, actually uh, the, the mayor brought this up. <laughs> so we, uh, mayor, mayor Pete said, uh, you know, we just sort of talk about what work is. So if we're gonna talk about the future of work, what we see in these kinds of transitions, which we often think of as market transitions. So Melissa mentioned that um, we, uh, my group, we started something called SOCAP, Social Capital Markets, uh, 10 years ago, as a matter of fact, which is a, an event that now has 3,500 attendees. But we basically thought that you, this whole idea of doing well and doing good, uh, having an impact, but also starting a business, you know, that might actually catch on. And so, uh, so we needed to help people to sort of step back and say, this is a market transition. This is the way people are going to be working likely in the future. Let's see if we can actually help people to all collaborate on how that could be done in a beneficial way. It's the same thing with work. We need to step back, say, what is this thing? How do we start thinking about what we designed work as before and what can we design work as in the future? So I maintain work that mechanically is just three things. It's a problem to be solved whether it's a dirty floor or a complex market entry strategy. It's a problem that has either been well-defined, that is, it's repetitive, it's got to be solved over and over again, or it's pretty unique. It's, nobody's actually figured out what that real problem is. How do we solve problems? Well, we perform tasks, and Mayor Pete did mention this. Um, uh, I'd, I'd be flattered if he actually read my piece on unbundling work, because I talk a lot about uh, unbundling tasks and that sort of thing. But, but the basic premise is to perform those tasks to solve, we perform tasks to solve problems. How do we perform tasks? We have skills. And there's uh, wonderful research going back to the 1950s that basically puts skills into sort of two different bins. Transferable skills usable in a range of different situations. Um, that's on the bottom. And then knowledges, bodies of information um, that we often gather in institutions like this. And I'll, I'll come back to those in just a second. But, but mechanically, it's important to think of work as these three elements because we tend to lose track in a lot of our work, a lot of our, our jobs, we tend to lose track of the problem that's trying to be solved. And instead, we just focus on the tasks. And if we're focusing on task optimization, we're losing track of that. Whereas actually, the reason we're paid, the reason pay, are people paying, uh, are paying us is to solve problems. Now, you know, in every single organization, there's one or two people that think it's their job to create problems. And you know exactly who I'm talking about. But for the most part, that's why we pay people. And so um, the, the, the reason this premise is so important to break it down to these fundamental building blocks, the DNA of what work is, is if we're going to reshape work in the future, we really have to have uh, an anchoring in those fundamentals. So if that's, if that's what work is, what's a skill? I mentioned there's a couple different kinds. So um, we haven't just gone through this major transition in the shift from an agricultural to an industrial economy. We also did this post-World War II. We came back on a war footing we basically built this massive industrial you know, um, uh, uh, economy built around a war footing. And then we had to suddenly create a consumer economy. Millions of people all suddenly had to figure out, well, what is work going to be going forward? And there was an amazing guy by the name of Sidney Fine started something called the Dictionary of Occupational Titles. And Sid was actually sort of an honorary uncle of mine. But he basically broke down skills into, by, an, by analyzing 32,000 jobs, broke them down in these different categories. And it's essentially, it's bodies of information that are rooted or anchored in a particular arena. So my knowledge of brain surgery is not going to necessarily help me to repair a car engine, or hopefully vice versa. Uh, so, so that's the knowledge is here. 
But then there are these transferable skills, skills usable in lots of different situations. So if you were, at say, at the age of five, you were trying to convince your parents to let you stay up past your bedtime, and magically they did, you're probably pretty good at convincing people, persuading. You're probably going to use that skill over and over again, and maybe you're going to go into sales, or maybe you're going to go business development, but you're going to find that you have learned those skills over time. Well, the problem is that when we're born, when you come out of the womb, nobody gave you the user manual of you. Nobody told you the skills that you were going to be good at. Nobody told you the problems you were going to be best at solving. You had to figure that out. How did you do that? Trial and error. We don't call it trial and success. We call it trial and error. You put your hand on the stove, it burns. Oh, bad idea. Don't do that again. Don't put your hand on the stove. Oh, you, per, you, were allowed to, you were able to persuade your parents to let you stay up past your bedtime. Ah, I'm good at that. Great. I can use persuading in a lot of different situations. Uh, I'm all in on a particular topic. I love butterflies or unicorns or rocks or any. I, I want to dive into a body of knowledge. And that's what drives a lot of the trial and error, the learning that we go through. We're trial and error machines. But because nobody gave us the user manual of us, we have to build it over time. All right, so if that's what work is, what a skill is, let's break down jobs. So let me tell you a quick story. So in that period where I was not going to college, <laughs> um, I was actually bouncing around to, uh, between a, a bunch of different, uh, uh, we, we would call them gigs today. Um, I, did, I think I did 17 different jobs over a period of six years. Um, but one of them was uh, I fell into the family business. So uh, my father was a minister um, at a, uh, uh, a, a cathedral in San Francisco. He was the canon pastor. And uh, after a couple of years, when I was uh, 13, he was, uh, he was fired. What, his favorite joke is, what do you do with a canon? You fire it. So, so um, he suddenly finds himself out of work. He eventually finds work helping other ministers who are on college campuses who themselves were being laid off. Well, he had experience with that. So he got a grant um, actually from Lilly uh, Foundation and he um, spent a year trying to build a picture of what the best techniques for job hunting were and he wrote a book for these ministers. And uh, when I was 15, I used to carry these books down. He was you know, self-published and take care of them down to the uh, post office. And I would ask him, why is somebody ordering your book from a corporation or from a university or from the Department of Labor. Why do they want to read your book? It's for ministers. And he said, I don't know. <laughs> Let me call them up and find out. So we called him up and found out. He said, well, there's no other compendium like this that breaks down how do you think about finding a job. And so he rewrote the book for the common person. It's a book called What Colors Your Parachute. Um, there's now 10 million copies in print, uh, 17 languages. Uh, my father passed away two years ago, but he left behind an amazing legacy. And what he found, because he was this incredible pattern recognizer, is that there are actually seven different components of you. Nobody gave you that user manual, but if you had it, there were seven different components of you that are really, really relevant to work. And they're also exactly the seven components of a job. And so this became a flower. It's a little easier to read when they're in blocks. But the basic premise is there's seven different pieces of it. Well, so I already talked about your transferable skills and your knowledges. But it turns out there are people, kinds of people, you are optimized to work best around. You enjoy working with the most. Um, they, one of his favorite jokes is he, uh, he, he literally was interviewing a guy who uh, was an embalmer. And he said, uh, why, 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 you, why did you like this job? He said, well, I like to work with people. And, uh, and uh, workplace. You are optimized to work in different kinds of work environments. Some people like it loud, some like it quiet, some like it light, some like it dark. There are different characteristics of how you're optimized to work best. Uh, geography, where, where do you want to be geographically? What are the characteristics of where you're happiest? And that's obvious, obvious, uh, calculus that needs to be worked back and forth with your spouse about where you want to be geographically and so on. And then um, your compensation. Uh, I think Mayor Pete was talking about this as well, is not just your pay, but your benefits, and you know, how much of that is anchored in your job. And then smack in the middle, and we'll talk about this quite a bit, is purpose. So this is the way I think about a job. It's these seven different characteristics. And in the past, up until now, in that industrial era transition, we created jobs, we sort of bundled them all together, very, very tightly bound. And we called that a job, an occupation, whatever, and we and had a set of characteristics and sort of edges to it. And, and that was a fairly static model um, in what I call the old rules of work. Um, all right, so work, skill, job, career. What's a career? Well, uh, my father 
after he wrote What Colors Your Parachute, uh, which in, incidentally he updated um, every year for 40 years. He used to say he wrote 40 different books, it just they all had the same title. Um, he also wrote a book called The Three Boxes of Life, and he wrote this at a very pivotal time in his life. My uncle Don um, was a reporter in Arizona who was killed in the line of duty in 1976. And so this just was a fundamental shift in my father's thinking, and he sort of stepped back, he said, well, okay, I've done this thing around work, but what is life work? Like, what are the issues related to life? And so he wrote this book called The Three Boxes of Life, which is no longer in print, but you can still get it on Amazon, because of course you can get everything on Amazon. Um, but, he, but his premise was that there's actually, a career is actually in three phases. There's a big glut of education at the beginning of our lives. We're, we're soaking in it. Why did we do that? Well, because we were going to make this big commitment to this big chunk of work. And in the old rules of work, in that older model, we're likely going to be in that same field for a long period of time. So it made a ton of sense to make a massive investment up front that was gonna be advertised over a long period of time. So a big chunk of work, education, learning at the beginning, then a big chunk of work, and then a big chunk of leisure in what I call the period formerly known as retirement. And so, so let it soak in for a minute. Um, and so, so my father at the, at the age of 90 was still updating his book when he passed away two years ago. And so he, you know, he sort of tried to work leisure in there, but, but basically he was still working until, um, until near his final days. And so this was the model that we all grew up. Nobody told us again, this is the arc of your life, but this is what we all sort of followed. Now, when you think about that box of, oops, just did the wrong thing. Think about, am I backing up well? Yeah, when you think about that box of learning right there, how do you break it down? Ah, well, back to these different kinds of skills. So when we come to a university, we sort of dive in on being a specialist on something, and we eventually go through an extraordinarily fractured process. I don't know why we don't require every single kid walking onto a college campus to do their own career planning before they do anything. It seems mystifying to me that we force the, the career office to deal with kids in the final five minutes that they're on the campus before they go out into that work box, but it seems to be our model. Um, so they dive in on this one thing, but then there's also this sort of generalist and broad knowledge, that is things that you're curious about and you keep on focusing on. IBM calls this T-skills. They've had this model for quite some time. And, and those of you who have read anything on the topic or knowledgeable, you, you, you immediately see, oh, well, this is hard skills and this is soft skills, which I just hate. It's really, these are knowledges anchored in this particular arena and these are transferable skills. Use them in a range of different places. But essentially, this is the way to, that we think about what the deliverable of that education experience is. And a liberal arts college is gonna probably over-index a little bit more on this, and more trade-focused, they'll focus more on that, but this is basically how we've calibrated our education model. And oh, by the way, we did that in the same time that we transitioned from a, an agricultural to an industrial economy. We created this structure for how we think about education. I'll talk about that in just a second. All right, so now, how does all this work in a work market? You saw the video earlier talking about the, the discussion of, are robots and software gonna take all that work? Are, they, are humans gonna have work? Well, how do we think about that? Um, my economist friends hate it when I oversimplify like this, and I think Helen, who was in the video, would, would be the most vociferous critic, but let me just give you, give you this as a framing, a way to think about it, a way to picture it, okay? So if this right here, the, the red circle, is us, messy, expensive human beings, and all of our skills, all the skills that we can bring to bear, and then this is all the problems to be solved, that is, it's all the paid work that there is, then this is a very simple way to look at the use cases. There are people that have jobs, they're being paid, they're doing work, solving problems. There's need, that is, there are open jobs, and then there's people that are unemployed or not working. That's overly simplistic, it doesn't work this way at all, but it's important to be thinking about, well, this is actually a constantly oscillating set of circles. That is that this changes all the time. As a matter of fact, it changes on a monthly basis. Uh, do you know about the JOLTS report? Don't, don't look at the unemployment statistics. JOLTS, just Google it, JOLTS report. What it'll tell you is that actually in every single month of the year in the United States, there are three to five million job openings that get filled. <laughs> right now it's seven million. That's what the JOLTS report will tell you. It's actually 7.5 and it's increasing. This, this bin here is increasing but they keep on getting filled, not all of them, and there's a lot that are still unfilled, but this is really important to be thinking about that work markets are constantly oscillating, and this is just using the old model. You know, think of, think of a job, think of that traditional job as one use case for work, but there's tons of new use cases for work. All right, so now, now that we got all those sort of basics, think of those as foundations. 
You don't have to buy my labels for these things, but what we find in market transitions, Ray and I were just talking about this at lunch, one of the things that's really helpful is to have a common language. So you've heard some of the language, for instance, that Chris was talking about around ethics and empathy and that sort of thing. This is a big market transition. Markets are gonna function really differently. Work markets are gonna function really differently and already are. We need to think about, well, how do we make that a beneficial transition? That is, how do we make sure people are all making the right decisions, the beneficial decisions for humans? Because that's what work markets are. That's essentially, it's, humans are gonna be solving a lot of these problems. I don't like the rhetoric, I don't like the labeling that elevates our technology to the levels of humans. So I don't talk about robots and software having, be, being our equals. I don't talk about them as being part of the workforce. I, I think that's actually a false god. And I'll, I'll come back and reinforce that again. As somebody who's been in Silicon Valley for 32 years, I can tell you it leads to some very, very negative consequences. But I think it's important for us to look at, all right, now, what does technology do? How does it change all this stuff? Okay, so a job becomes unbundled. And, and again, Mayor, Mayor Pete uh, mentioned this, is that essentially we think of it as a bundle of tasks all bundled together, but actually all these pieces come apart. Why do they come apart? They come apart because there are innovators that are working at every single one of these arenas to unbundle them. That's how Silicon Valley works. Silicon Valley work basically disrupts arenas in two ways, gorillas and termites. And I'm happy to talk about, if you're interested in you know, the, the impact on higher education, those of your educators, um, how that model sort of maps out. I've written a series of papers on unbundling work, unbundling higher education, and so on. Uh, if, you, if you're an educator, don't read Unbundling Higher Education or you won't sleep tonight. So, um, but, but the basic premise is unbundling. This comes from the work, uh, actually a guy at Deloitte uh, by the name of John Hagel, a good friend of mine. Um, I used his model and I applied it to a range of different industries and roles. But unbundling jobs, this is what's happening right now. This is that old use case, the old rules of work, are, the jobs are becoming unbundled. And there are innovators that are focusing on every one of these arenas. Now there is no Uber of jobs. Hasn't happened, probably won't happen. But there are termites, that is, there are thousands and thousands of innovators that are eating away at the bottom. There, right now, just in higher ed, in, in ed tech, not just higher ed, but across the board, there are 20,000 startups across the, the world, 20,000 ed tech startups fueled by $6 billion in venture capital. That's a lot of termites. So what ends up happening is they become unbundled. These markets that these innovators are focusing on, they take different pieces. So who focuses on skills? Well, there's tons of learning platforms that are focused on skills. Who focuses on um, the workplace of WeWork and a variety of other co-working facilities are all saying, well, work's becoming unbundled. Let's get a whole bunch of people to work here as opposed to going to the corporate office. Uh, infra bodies of information, well, more and more colleges are putting more and more of that learning online and making it part of an unbundled uh, uncredentialed, um, uh, or maybe it's badged, uh, learning process that we then are gonna have to assemble together and so on. Um, the, I'll come back to purpose a little bit later. Geography, we're basically blowing apart geography. The idea that you had to be working next to your coworkers. There's tons of innovators that are all focusing on unbundling our ability to be able to work with each other at a distance. And so you take all those different pieces, work jobs, the traditional job is becoming unbundled. Well, what about careers? <laughs> Remember that model, the three boxes model? This is the new model. So yes, I went to school. Then I got out and I worked for a little while, but then, oh, I took a gap year and I went traveling with my friends, but I'm still learning online. And then I get a day job, but I'm actually driving for Uber at night. I'm working on a startup with my friends too. Oh, and we run off for a weekend someplace. And then oh, I got a real job for a while, but maybe not, I'm working on this. So this is a rational response to a world of exponential change. This is what young people are doing. This is the model in response to the fact that the contract between, the traditional contract between a job, an employer, and a worker has eroded. So that's why I don't talk a lot about employers and employees nowadays. I talk about hirers and workers because there are all these new use cases. And young people today, this is a rational response. If you can't guarantee that your employer is going to have loyalty to you, why are you going to be loyal to that employer? And so I call this a portfolio of work. So what does your investment counselor advise you to do? Distribute your risk. I got a safe investment. That's my day job. Um, I need to fill in a little bit. Oh, okay, that's driving for Uber at night. And I oh, I want to, I've got a high risk part of my portfolio. That's doing a startup with my friends. Is that going to pay off or not? I don't know. This is a rational response to an exponentially changing world. And so that portfolio of work is increasingly what 
young people are having to assemble themselves, and we have given them no help. I get parents all, all the time asking me, um, you know, my, my kid, why won't my kid get a real job? And this is my response. <laughs> they are distributing risk. They're trying to continually learn. Remember the T-skills thing? They're trying to continually think of the things that they're fascinated by while they're getting an income, hopefully, but then they're always looking at the next thing and the next thing and the next thing because they will need to. They will need to be continually adaptive. All right, so let's take all these different pieces and let's put them together in the context of the future of work and how we can think about it. And there are tons of studies uh, that are all trying to suss out that future, that are basically trying to have the kind of understanding. Um, and you saw in some of the videos, um, some of the discussion earlier about this calculus of will robots and software take every job or not, or will it, you know, I actually think this is, this is a false discussion, or rather, we have to step back and ask ourselves, what would we do differently depending upon what future we actually end up creating together? So let me just give you three is a different way to think about it. So the dystopian one, I won't show you all the headlines, but you've seen them, 47 million jobs, 800 million jobs taken away by robots, gone, you know, just ripped off, ripped from out of their hands. Um, so so there's the, the rhetoric is, oh, there's gonna be all this unemployment and um, lots of lots of robots doing all this, uh, lots of AI software doing all that work and, and humans lose. Now, this is the narrative that high tech, that Silicon Valley wants to follow. It's, it's Silicon Valley dancing in the end zone, right? There's a picture, a whole bunch, big picture of Mark Zuckerberg dancing right down here on the field. Technology won, humans lost. I'm gonna go count my money, right? So, so it, 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 the innovator doesn't have an investment, for the most part, in humans having work in the future. Instead, what, they're, what are they encouraged by their venture capitalists to do? 10x something. Find something that people are already spending a lot of money on, messy, expensive humans, <laughs> and make it a tenth of the cost, or 10 times better, or 100 times better. Well, what are you gonna do? You're gonna find out work processes that you can improve, and, and the disruption, well, you know, we're gonna kind of leave that to humans to figure out. Um, you know, when, when Travis Kalanick started Uber, um, you know, and as, as uh, I think Chris was saying, you know, you, 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 or uh, yeah, your Christmas Sacramento was saying, you know, you're getting into a stranger's car, something your mother told you never to do. <laughs> Um, he didn't say, Travis didn't say, I'm going to make the taxi business a lot better. I'm going to improve those cabs. He just routed right around it. And he decided, okay, I'm going to just go and make something totally new. And ultimately, I'm going to throw self-driving cars at it, and everything will be fine for me, for the platform. So um, uh, work market platforms all have the same dynamic. There are three players. Um, whenever there's uh, you, any gig work, anything like that, there's the platform, there's supply, that's us, messy, expensive humans, and there's demand. Two out of three will always win. Demand and the platform. And supply normally loses. That is, there's wage compression constantly pushing it down. So in this, in this model, a lot of humans get left out in the cold. All right, so that's, that's an, we, we can all be depressed and go slash our wrists if we think this is what the future is. Oh, and by the way, if you really want some color around this, that Oxford study that many have mentioned, you can go to willrobotstakemyjob.com. <laughs> go try it out. Uh, oh, and if you want to know where the robots are, you're soaking in it. <laughs> by, by the way, I, I, I came here from San Francisco. I have never flown so far, across the, far, far east across the country to a place called the Midwest. <laughs> Think about it. That's the Midwest. I don't, well, anyway, okay. All right. So, all right. So, what's the number one job? Telemarketers. You know, percentage of phone calls in the United States by the end of this year are going to be robocalls? 50%. 17 billion phone calls. 50% of all phone calls. So, telemarketers, number one job, 99%. They're at risk, right? Okay, so that's the dystopian one. Now, let's, let's go to utopian. Opposite. No, AI and software is going to create a golden age for jobs, and all this new opportunity is gonna pop up. Lots of robots, but lots of jobs, because the robots are helping us. We're participating in the value that they're creating. So humans dancing, and, uh, and hopefully Mark Zuckerberg can still dance in the end zone, but it's because humans have done so well. There's always new need. Well, why do we not, why aren't we certain about this? Why is there so much uncertainty? If I took you back 150 years and we're standing in a cornfield here in Indiana, and I tell you, we have got to envision this thing in this transition to an industrial economy. We've got to come up with 
jobs and corporations and factories and assembly lines, and you'd have a failure of imagination. You would not have been able to envision that future. We can't envision this. The pace of change is too exponential. It's moving too quickly. So instead, we have to say, well, wait a minute. What are the design heuristics for how we get a more positive future? What the data shows right now is it's actually, this is the most likely. Scenario number three. That is, there's a lot of demand. It's not being filled by these people because they're not able to move fast enough. That doesn't mean they're unemployed. What it normally means is they're working in crappy jobs, less good pay, more precarity. As our friends at the Ford Foundation say, more, it's, it's more and more unstable. All right, so what do we get? So let me give you a couple of what I call fire starters. You don't have to agree with my, my framing here, but I'll give you three takeaways from this, and then let's talk about solutions. Let's talk about strategies, like how we actually make this positive future work. All right, so I would urge you not to worry about the robot apocalypse. That is, if you can't do something very specific about something, why are you worrying about it? Factor instead for what needs to be solved. And if you solve it right today, it'll solve itself for tomorrow too. And so it's the pace and spread of change. It's that right here, these people, we need them to continually stay at the front edge of what work opportunity is there. And we need to have technology help people to do that. But it's the pace and spread of change. That's why we're seeing this cognitive dissonance. Second, robots and software simply don't take jobs. Humans give them away. <laughs> This is not a law of nature. The fact that somebody ought, so um, let me give you a thought experiment since this uh, Mayor Pete started us off on this road. You're the head of a corporation. You've got 10,000 employees. You bring in a whole bunch of new technology and you automate 20% of the tasks. Remember, they don't take jobs, they take tasks. 20% of the jobs in your company. What are your options? Lay off 20% of your people or as they do in Germany, ask everybody to take a 20% pay cut. Or say, wait a minute, what Google used to do is take 20% of your time and come up with something new for the corporation. Come up with our next product. That's how Gmail occurred. That's how Google Apps occurred. It was because somebody who had an extra day a week was given an extra day a week to come up with the next generation product. These are rational acts if you think differently about why you are employing human beings. But, but robots and software do not take jobs. And then finally, it is that issue around stable, well-paid work. So, oh, and by the way, that dystopian thing, let's look at the fine print. <laughs> that Oxford study actually said in the next five years, telemarketers only dropping by 3%. In, I'm a recovering journalist. I used to run half a dozen technology magazines. Um, the, the job apocalypse has already happened. In the past 25 years, 50%, there's 50% there's less jobs in traditional media than there were 25 years ago. All the jobs moved over to online media. As a matter of fact, there's tons more employment. So we've already seen this. It's happening now in retail. You, you've seen this over and over again. It's only going to happen more quickly. But we always get it wrong. We always mispredict what the actual dynamics in the work market are. And, and the same thing with truckers. Right now, trucker, we have, there's, a, there's a huge rhetoric around what self-driving trucks are going to do to, to uh, truck drivers. First off, there's 4.5 there's 4 million truck drivers in the United States, half of them long haul, half of them short haul. Do, do you know that, that you know what the turnover in that, that industry is? 90%. If you, if you have 10 people working for you, you're a trucking company, nine of them will be gone by the end of this year. So it's, it's a tough job. It's really, really hard. My, my niece is a, and she and her husband, are, they're based in Boise, Idaho. They're truck drivers, four days a week, doing the circuit through the northeast, northwest. And, and so, but it's going to take a long time to actually have an impact on that arena. So we can't use that as the bogeyman. We have to instead say, well, wait a minute, how do we help them go through the transition? And it's this precarity. It's the fact that there is constant downward uh, pressure on wages of the jobs that are not, the work that is not the most uh, in demand. That is one of our biggest challenges. And this is the other challenge. Several speakers, I think, mentioned this. But basically, so this is wealth. This is like assets. It isn't income. Income has a different chart. I'm just showing you this one because it's even scarier. So uh, this is wealth. In the United States, so basically, a third of the wealth is held by the top 1%, another third by the next 9%, and a descending third. See how the next 40%? So this is 50% of the wealth is in, uh, sorry, um, yeah, yeah, 50% yeah, of the wealth is in the hands of um, uh, sorry, 98% of the wealth is in the hands of 50% of the people. This is all the wealth in the hands of the other 50%. That's 
all of the assets and it's descending. It's going smaller and smaller. So this is our challenge, is that our, our, basically our work markets, all the dynamics of our work markets today have these same dynamics that we're worried about in the future, but we need to solve for today. So I like to say, just as Bill Gibson said, the future is already here, but it's not evenly distributed. We already have abundance, but it's not evenly distributed. And so that doesn't mean that we need to become a socialist country overnight. It means that we need to think about our peculiar form of capitalism and its design heuristics. Right now, we reward capital over labor. You know why we did that? We did that because we needed a whole bunch of factories and roads. Do we have a lot of factories and roads now? I think so. But we still tax capital at a lower rate than we tax labor, which just didn't seem to make a ton of sense. So these are some of the things that we need to be thinking about, these very fundamental underpinnings. And by the way, you've all seen these things, you know, that, that the career builder did this study last year. 78% of all your workers in the United States live paycheck to paycheck. About the same number, a $400 un, un, unplanned event would actually put them at a disadvantage. So now, now, that, now that I've completely depressed every single person in the audience, let's go back up. <laughs> Let's ride the exponential curve, but let's figure out how we solve this together. And then I'd love to make it a dialogue. I'd love to, love to get your, your questions, thoughts, disagreements, and so on. But so, so there's a big, messy space. And as you've seen, there's, there's so many different perspectives. People are coming. It's a blind man and the elephant kind of thing. Or as we like to say, it's a wicked problem. Wicked problems all have the same dynamic. I've written a bunch of papers on this. Uh, wicked problems, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of literature on this. But the basic premise is it's a large, multidimensional problem that has a lot of different stakeholders. Going to try to solve the problem in one place is a game of whack-a-mole. I, I mentioned this in Europe and nobody went, whack-a-what? Uh, uh, I, I go to hit it over here and then, you know, so I want to I affect worker wages over here, but oh, but then benefits it's over here and then it's, so the problems are constantly moving. But the most fundamental dynamic of wicked problems is that somebody's making money off the way it works today. That's the most fundamental dynamic. So what do the enemies of the future have only one strategy? Delay. Delay. I'm making money off the way it works now. Look at uh, the challenges that we have with getting rural broadband. Um, my, my organization, we used to run a set of conferences focused on trying to support rural broadband. Well, the existing telecommunications carriers have no incentive to make that easily and cheaply available. They want to amortize their existing cable plants as long as they possibly can. So all they have to do, do you know there are laws on 26 states, ledgers, that do not allow local communities to develop their own broadband networks. So all that the enemies of the future have to do is to delay. So let's see how we can turn the calculus around. All right, so I tend to, because it's a big messy space, I tend to say, well, let's try to distill. I'm not trying to say simplify because I don't want to oversimplify, but I want to distill. To take all the different elements around the future of work, I'd like to give us four anchors, four domains, okay? Individuals, organizations, communities, and countries. And I want to talk about the problem state for each one of them, and then let's just talk briefly about some of the solutions that we're seeing, amazing work that's being done all around the world, and then we can start to think about, well, what are the ways we can better coordinate? Because that is critical. Building better connective tissue between different stakeholders, between schools and employers, between community organizations and funders. Building better dynamics of connection is what helps to solve these market transitions more beneficially. So what's the problem for individuals? If we can wave a magic wand and solve the problem for every human being that wants to work, it would be finding or creating, because we have to support entrepreneurs as well, meaningful, well-paid work today and tomorrow. Now, there are tons of other issues for every human being. We've talked about well-being and thriving and so on. All these things are critical for human beings. But if what we're trying to do is really solve the core underpinning of work, if we could wave a magic wand and every single human being could have meaningful, well-paid work today and tomorrow, we probably would have solved the lion's share of the problem. What are the challenges for organizations? So now let's flip it. You know, the, the, the demand side. Organizations need to have the talented workers that they either develop or they find today and tomorrow. So when I, when I lecture, I, I work with um, chief human resources officers for organizations around the country. I say, you are at one of the most pivotal times in human history. Remember when we created organizations back in that transition from the, the um, agricultural economy to the industrial economy? We're rethinking what the role of humans and work is 
This is an amazing time to be alive. But if you focus on just trying to manage the way you have in the past, you think of it as human resources, as this sort of, you know, basically the, the paper pushing part of the process of bringing humans into an organization or developing them, then we've all failed. So how can you have those talented workers that you need for communities? What were the mayors talking about? They want to be ecosystems in which all their constituents can thrive. And that's a constantly moving landscape. But they want to be a, they, they want to be a platform. They want to be a way that those, those uh, various stakeholders can all do well. And then finally, uh, when I, when I uh, sit down with the heads of labor for uh, countries around the world, this is what they will say to me is, I, I want to build an inclusive economy. I want everybody to benefit. How do I do that? So I'm going to just give you a couple of quick examples and run through a model and then, and then let's uh, make it a discussion. So, okay, let's start with individuals. Uh, mindset and skill set. So let me tell you a quick story. So I'm going to show you a little video. So um, mindset and skill set. Why, why, why do I break those things out? Why, why, why are these part of the solutions for individuals? So you're, uh, okay, I'm sorry. Can we run the, run the video for the, yeah. There, okay, now we're good. All right, so you're, I wave a magic wand. You're standing at the bottom of a mountain. And you look up at the mountain, and suddenly I have given you all of the ability, all the knowledge you need to climb a mountain. You are a mountain climber. You have all the tools, everything. But you look up at the top of the mountain, and you say, oh, it's cold, it's really hot, I'm not going to climb. All right, so you have all the, all the skill set, none of the mindset. I wave my magic wand again. Now I say, you have all the mindset, but none of the skill set. You don't know how to climb a mountain. But you look up at the top and you say, well, how hard could that be? That's not that hard. I'm good. One step, two steps. You're going to encounter problems. You're going to solve problems. That's what you do. And then you're going to reach the top of the mountain. And you look down and you say, well, how hard was that? Because you had the mindset that you needed to be able to achieve it. So let me give you a great example. There's not a parent in the world that isn't worried right now. Not a parent. <laughs> OK, what happens at the top? Um, so, but I'm going to keep on talking while you're distracted. So, so let me give you an example. There's a woman who runs an ed tech startup, um, media startup, told me this great story about her 15-year-old. 15-year-old had a summer job, local business, going to be working for the head of IT. Shows up on day one, beginning of the summer, goes to the office manager, okay, I'm here, I'm ready to work. And the, and the office manager says, um, oh, he quit. The head of IT quit. So he's thinking, oh, geez, no, no job, nothing. Okay, so she says, wait a minute. You know what he was going to do? He was going to install security software on every, every one of the PCs in our office. Can you do that? So the kid says, sure. Goes home, looks on YouTube, reads the manual for the software, and over the summer installs it flawlessly on every single one of the computers. None of the skill set, all of the mindset. Now, he could have just said, ah, oh, sorry, I'm not up for that. No, I can't do that. I don't know. There shouldn't be an educator in, in the room that isn't terrified. <laughs> Because it's just in time learning and just in context learning. He didn't go for a four-year IT degree, then come back and say, OK, I'm ready. He just said, sure, I can do that. And, and his digital distraction machine was the gateway to the world's information. He just solved it just in time. He only gathered the information he needed. And in context, it was just to solve the problem in front of him. He didn't go learn about programming or anything like that. He learned about solving the problem in front of him. And so that's really the mindset. This kid didn't say, well, how am I going to do that? Like, what do I do? No. It had the mindset and just did it. All right. So let's move on. How do we think about this now? I'm going to run through this model real quick and then hopefully get to Q&A. So how do we think about this in terms of your skills and the skills that we're trying to help people to encourage to develop? So we, we like, like this model. This is actually a model my father came up with. I came up with the visuals. So this is, on this axis, this is what you're good at. On this axis, this is what you love to do. Doesn't take a rocket scientist to think, okay, you're not very good at it, you don't love to do it, why, why would you work it? Why would you do that work? Well, you know, we, we all have, for expediency's sake, we all have to do certain kind of work. My first job out of high school was making two piles of paper out of one and then faxing it. Has anybody here seen a fax? <laughs> so it's getting the age level again, okay? So, all right. So, so, so yeah, I, I sucked at it and, uh, and I hated it, but I did it, right? Oh, oh, now you're good at it, but you don't love it. Again, expediency's sake, we're all doing work that we didn't do. Um, I, I, at the age of 19, when I was trained in my father's methods, I was doing career counseling for people in their 40s and 50s. And they would say, I am stuck in a dead-end job. I used to love it, but I hate it now. What do I do? Well, you don't find people move this way. You don't find that they are good at it, 
and they hate it, but then they suddenly start to love it. It's not very common. Ah, now, you love it, but you're not very good at it. Well, trial and error machine. You're going to keep on trying it again and again and again, and you're going to start, you're going to have a far greater likelihood that you're going to move up that curve. And this is why I call them superpowers. Uh, my friend Danielle Perot, he calls these your ultimate skills. But basically, it's the intersection of the things that you're good on, things that you love. And remember that portfolio of work? That is the trial and error machine you're constantly going through to try to find that intersection. And oh, by the way, those repetitive, boring tasks down there that could be done over and over again the same way, as Mayor Pete was saying, that's the purview of robots and software. Unique, creative solutions to problems to be solved, that's where human potential is. So let me, this is another way to look at it. I've, if, if you want to see a lot of these background writings, um, you can follow me on LinkedIn or I've, I've posted a lot of these articles in my feed. But basically, I've got a long piece on how the, basically the spectrum of enthusiasm. You go from, I have no interest in it all, oh no, I'm actually, I'm reading more and more articles on this. Oh, now I'm really interested. Sort of becomes my subject and my hobby and then my work. And some people stop there. And that is just fine. If you want to follow the old rules of work and it's just about feeding your family and putting a roof over your head, that is just fine. But some people continue to find their passion, their mission, their reason for being on the planet. And increasingly, this is the realm we have to help people find because it's what will keep us ahead of the robots and software. Um, and I talk about four skills then when we're helping people to find those passions. Um, and so problem solvers who are adaptive, creative, and, em and have empathy. Um, and it just so happens it's, you know, I talk about the pace of change. It's a nice, you know, convenient acronym. acronym. Uh, let me talk about problem solvers. So I mentioned that's what work is, solving problems. Those of you who are parents in the, in the audience, <laughs> I get asked by a lot of parents, how will my kid be happy and successful? I tell them, I'll give you one simple answer, drop successful, drop successful. Yeah, in, in, and I'm sure you have it in your area. We, we talk a lot in the Bay Area about helicopter parents who don't want their kids to apparently encounter any problem. They want to just hover over them and watch them as they're, well, then, the, then the, you know the next step, right? It's a uh, street sweeper parent. It's going ahead of your kid and clearing the way. And I will guarantee you the next one is going to be wrecking ball parents. They will smash any opposition in front of their child. So, so, so this, if, if you're doing that, your kid will never become a problem solver. Your kid falls down, let the kid put themselves up. Kid encounters a problem, let them solve it themselves. This, this, you, we cannot helicopter them into the future. It's not going to happen. We need them to become problem solvers. They have to find problems that they are all in on, that they love to solve. Now, there are two kinds of problems. There are the problems you choose, the problems that you want to solve, and then the problems that choose you. There are 70, uh, 68 million people are refugees in the world. There are millions who are handicapped. There are, there are tons of people who have had huge challenges that they have had to overcome simply to get to work, that, that, to solve problems. We need to help them more and more to become better problem solvers, and we need to help them as problem solvers ourselves. Adaptive, because nothing in the world is, is absolutely guaranteed but that, that pace of change. Uh, cre oh, sorry. Creative because that's what keeps us ahead of robots and software. And then I think Chris made all of my case for empathy. If you just don't agree by now, it, it, and then after this, go in the back room, he'll, he'll work on you. All right, so, all right, so, and increasingly we can use technology to help people to have pace. Uh, one example, uh, how many of you know about Stitch Fix? So startup, yeah, there you go, wonderful. You know how it works is you order clothes, clothes come, there is a human that is working in conjunction, has a, the aid of artificial intelligence software, and they're building a model of the clothes that you like. And over time, you get sent more and more clothes. The ones you keep, they know, oh, you like those. The ones you don't, you send back. Their goal is to continually get to a point where you keep everything. Better than the human alone, better than the AI alone. Now, they are not equal. <laughs> the tool is helping the human. Do not make that mistake. They're not equal. But increasingly, we can use technology, and I wrote a piece on this, six different superpowers of AI. But basically, the premise is we can take all that innovation that is going to automate human tasks, and we can apply it to helping humans. Uh, There's a great example, Squirrel AI. Just Google them. Uh, this is an organization in China. They, um, we had them at the Singularity University Summit last, uh, last year. So uh, they've been around for two years. 
They've come up with AI software that builds a model, a psychological model, the way the kid learns, and then helps them after school to catch up on math and science. In two years, they have one million customers and a thousand learning centers around the country. And it's basically leveraging technology to help better understand the way kids learn and then presenting them learning models in exactly that structure. Organizations, and I'm not gonna belabor this too much. Uh, I don't know if there's any human resources folks in the audience, but I've written a lot on this. I talk a lot about this. We have to rethink the organization, like completely. The old model of the organization was a box. There's abundance outside the box. That is lots of people that wanna get in. They want jobs. And there's scarcity inside the box. And what we've done is we've actually created sorting hat functions. Uh, Harry Potter fans in the audience? Uh, <laughs> oh, you fit in the, you're a round peg. You fit in this round slot. OK, great, you're in. You're in the box. We have to completely rethink the model. Um, we can't just make organizations that are going to be faster caterpillars. That is, we can't think of the organization as being that box, as being a hierarchy that we can simply put a jetpack on. We've got to rethink the organization entirely. We've got to think of it as a network that is the soft walls of an organization as continually having a whole bunch of problem solvers that are flowing through its domain. And I'm happy to give you more detail on that in Q&A if you want. But the basic premise is this is the only way we're going to get diversity and inclusion. Um, this is uh, Verna Myers uh, wrote Moving Diversity Forward. Diversity is being invited to the party. Inclusion is being asked to dance. We need to create more diverse and inclusive organizations that have soft walls that bring in the non-traditional people. And I'm going to argue there's a step even beyond this, is that actually the future of the organization is that everybody gets to be the choreographer as well. That is, people that are the workers are the ones that are actually helping to design that organization. And if there's any one change I would make, maybe very magic one, it would be that organizations develop purpose. The reason we started this event called SOCAP, Social Capital Markets, is we said you could do well and do good. If the ultimate purpose of every organization on the planet is simply to meet the needs of shareholders, you already know how that story plays out. We've got that economy. Not very inclusive. So we need to expand the range of, shake, of stare, uh, shake, uh, stakeholders within an organization to include employees, uh, partners, communities, and so on, uh, the planet. Because if we don't do that, then we're going to continue to get what we've got. And again, we can throw AI at the problem. Now, let me tell you one quick moment. I don't want to send the uh, folks in the later panel running to try to look at their thesauruses to find alternate words. I want to warn you about reskilling, upskilling, and new skilling. It kind of sounds like that. <laughs> I, I, I worry about industrial processes. I worry about thinking about workers as being unworthy, and we have to upskill them to make them worthy for this new economy. We need to empower. We need to think about how we can help people to continually be lifelong learners and train themselves. Let's be very careful about industrial era labels. Communities. Uh, I won't belabor this, but uh, we do a lot of work. My group does a lot of work with National League of Cities and other organizations around the world. And the deliverable here is to think of yourself as an ecosystem. Understand the ecosystem. And I tell uh, mayors and uh, leaders of communities, your number one deliverable is not an answer. It's not the answer of how to solve for the future of work. It's a process. It's a process that will survive your tenure of helping people to collaborate, to build the connective tissues between them. A Kauffman strategy of things. There's a range of different models. Kauffman Foundation has a ton of stuff on building entrepreneurial ecosystems. If your focus is on community, if your anchor is communities, I advise you to dive into it. And, oh, and, and by the way, we can fix the learning market. Uh, the, the education system, how many of you in the, in the room are educators? My condolences. Um, uh, the, the, uh, that, that model, I, the reason I wrote the piece on unbundling higher education is that the model is changing very, very quickly. And I think in all very positive ways, but the learning markets will look very, very different in the future. This is really the model we need to be thinking about, is that lifelong learners are going to be building portfolios of learning. And the educational institution cannot be a tax on that. Uh, what business do you know of in the world that treats you for four years as a customer and for the rest of your life as a cash register? You're, 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 you're standing in a, in a monument to the past that, that the alumni funded. Instead, we have to help them, and we have to help tenured teachers who are also, unfortunately, sometimes attacks on innovation. We have to help them all embrace a future of portfolios of learning that will be lifelong. And again, we can throw software at the problem. And then finally, how do you build an inclusive economy? Right now, we have safety nets. There are other countries that have much, much better safety nets that is, have thought about the precarity of living. 
We don't need to design for this future where every single person is going to have the perfect job. No, it's going to be this constant oscillation for so many different populations. We can think differently. We can design the heuristics of our economy and of our policies so that they're adaptive. That is, that they're anchored in the constant changes that we know are going to happen, that they are integrated. That is, that we have the software and the other the processes that people follow to be able to work together to ensure that we're factoring for all of the holes that are created, and we can start to close those up. Look at the Nordic countries. I just came from doing a talk in, uh, uh, in uh, Norway. Look at the Nordic countries. They, they have, look at Germany. They've made a bunch of decisions baked into their economies about thinking differently and filling in the holes in that safety net. All right, so I'm just going to stop there and say, OK, let's just simplify, and then I'd love to hop into Q&A. Uh, if you're focused on individuals, I'm going to say, don't, don't just take my label for it, but the basic premise is if we're trying to figure out, are we going to help upgrade humans and help them to be able to adapt to this constantly changing world, or are we going to fix the system? The answer is let's do both. Let's help humans to have pace, and let's figure out how we change the system. Uh, with organizations, expand the range of stakeholders. Help your organization, help your company to see itself as a platform for enabling the future benefit of not just customers, not, or not just, not just stakeholders, shareholders, but other stakeholders. For communities, get a process, the process that survives you. And then if you're focused on especially national policy, I, I know it sounds a little pejorative, but uh, get a clue. Uh, the, the system itself is broken. That is, we do not have, we have not balanced systems. We have imbalanced system. We have a highly imbalanced system. One of the reasons you're seeing so much innovation that is happening at the state and the local level is because we're frozen at the national level. We need to change that dynamic. We need to think differently about building these smart adaptive policies. So, so I'm just going to end on this note. I talked a lot about superpowers. I talked to a lot of different groups, and they say, well, what can I do? Well, the answer is everybody can do something. Everybody can wear the cape. You can wear the cape. If you're a student, you can focus on how do I find the thing that I feel I'm meant to do on this planet. If you are a parent, you can give your kid the, the, the cape. <laughs> Help them to go off and find what their superpowers are. If you're the head of a corporation, you can help your employees to have the cape, to find the thing that they're meant to do. If you're an educator, you can change your system so that you're helping people to develop the cape over their lives. Everybody can wear the cape. If we all think of this future of work as being something that we can actually have a change, have an impact on, then we can all develop our own superpowers. So I'm gonna stop there. And I'd love to get your questions. Of course, Melissa, I think you're going to tell me I'm out of time. Uh, no, I'm, we're going to give you a few minutes. OK, a couple minutes for OK. Yep. All right, I don't, want to, I don't want to infringe on the break. There's a question back here. Oh, and please tell me your name. Uh, I have a question on the, on the T, or the yeah. partial T you had up there. Yeah. Do you have any finer granularity to that? Is that like a, a like digital, a T model? Yeah, like is that a digital persona of somebody, or could that be uh, with soft skills, uh, technical skills, yeah. professional skills, and then so there's points on there where somebody, an employer, or an employee can click through to look at the details of where they are through the life cycle of their jobs yeah. to see where they can then aspire to go within that organization, and it's good for retention and all those other obvious things. Yeah. So, so excellent question. So there are innovators all around the world that are focused on this issue. We have an initiative um, that um, uh, we, we've, we're, we're, the, we're basically bringing together. We call it the Skills Summit. But the basic premise is that we want to bring a range of stakeholders that care about skills and other attributes of human beings to be able to help them to be able to capture the, that information and then be able to have that used in a, in a way that is useful both on a granular level by a hiring manager and, um, and at scale. So uh, there are tons of initiatives like this around the world. There are tons of innovators. Um, there, uh, to check out Skyhive in Canada. Um, uh, check out SkillsBridge in Luxembourg. There are lots of initiatives that are trying to do what you're talking about. They come at it from different lenses. Some are trying to empower the individual to be able to articulate that information and to put it online. Others are coming at it from the top because they've got huge workforce issues. 50 or 100,000 people who are being considered quote unquote redundant. 
and trying to figure out how can you help AI to help them figure out what the future pathing is. We're at the front end, we're at early days for that, but our vision is that within the next 10 years, there will be a flexible open infrastructure where everything you're talking about will be possible and more, and there'll be tons of innovators that will all be using that information fabric from helping individuals to be able to find or create meaningful work to helping organizations to find the right people. What I worry about is sorting hat functions. I worry about throwing AI at a process that will simply get you a better round slot. That's, that's, that's what I worry about. And so I think that's one of the things we need to design for. Other questions, thoughts, disagreements? I've worn you all down. Yes. <laughs> uh, Leighton Johnson. Um, so I'm curious, going on your, the thread around diversity and inclusion and inclusive economy, um, a lot of people of color, women are locked out of the um, innovation economy. A lot of studies, research yeah. shows that continuously. Um, so in, this, um, in, in your work with organizational redesign, um, what's the role in reducing and working to eliminate unconscious and conscious bias yeah. um, sort of in how companies hire, how they um, unlock uh, resources and how they work with um, communities to build that inclusive element? Yeah, excellent question. So um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just tell you some of the basics of what I see that is uh, that it show good signs and I'll say, tell you where I think a lot of the work still needs to be done. Where, where I've seen the best approaches is where the education begins with the hiring manager because the model that we have right now, the way the work markets work is they are, it, uh, I think it was Shakespeare said that uh, life is a tale told by an idiot. Well, the, the work market process is designed by, you know, uh, so, some idiot process. I have, I have no idea how, how we came to this. A job description does not describe the problems to be solved, and a resume does not describe you. It does, just doesn't. That's not who you are. And so we take these orthogonal information spaces and we put them together, and then it becomes an arms race between keywords. <laughs> Can you throw a keyword into a job description that somebody that, that a that job hunter isn't using quite yet so you can fill, oh no, they all have it. It's an arms race, right? So, because everybody's using AI software to figure that out. And so what happens is if you go back to the hiring manager and you help them to, to unbundle the problems that need to be solved and then to use hiring, open hiring processes that guarantee that they will all the biases that are built in, and there's plenty of innovators that are focusing on this, uh, you know, gender blind, uh, skills, but even pay blind, you, you find that, that there's a lot of biases in previous pay history because women are historically in many industries underpaid less than men. So, so what you wanna do is both train that hiring manager to think differently, to, to de describe the problems to be solved, not to just take the the job description of Fred. Remember, Fred was the guy who did it before, and I loved Fred, and Fred's gone, and I just want to find another Fred. So I'm going to take the old job description of Fred, I'm going to slap some lipstick on, I'm going to put it out on D.com, and maybe, God hoping, I'm going to find Fred. That is a fail for everybody. And so uh, training managers to have more inclusive thinking is, is absolutely critical, because otherwise the system will not, what, what ultimately comes down to that hiring process is they will not make the right choice. They will not make an open and diverse choice. So I'm, I'm, I'm simplifying, and I'm happy to talk about this more and point you to some of the other programs that we've seen that are successful, but those are the, the throttle points. Train the manager, put software in the process that makes it, um, makes it blind. Any other, last question? Yes, over here. We are researching and others is that uh, AI can be used to enforce bias. You know, decisions Absolutely. could be made, um, you know, based on you know a, a, what the people creating the algorithm may think of objective factors yeah. um, like credit histories, or uh, you know, for example. But the reason that credit histories are different are, are about you know structural um, racism in our economy. What are your thoughts, and what are you hearing from tech companies about trying to you know uh, be conscious about designing AI uh, in a way that's you know not perpetuating bias? Absolutely, no, that's a great question. So, so Ray and I were talking about this a little bit at, at, uh, at lunch. Let me just give you some of the framing. So first off, the two, uh, and, and, and playing off of what Chris was talking about with ethics. So the two places that we need to really have a significant impact in education and training are from tech, the people that are creating the technology in the first place. So any school, any college that does not have ethics 
baked into the front end of any technological, technological learning, whether it's programming, UX design, any of that sort of stuff, is a fail. Because what ends up happening then is that engineer is going to continue when they get into industry, is going to have all these biases that they are completely unconscious about and are going to bake in. Even if they're building anti-bias software, they're still going to bake it in. Um, did, you know, did you know that the software that Uber used in its self-driving cars in its test in Phoenix was partially blind to people of color because they just didn't test it on people of color. So it actually would have hit somebody crossing the street. And so those biases are baked in from a very early part. And then we need to take the people that are already out in the wild and do a bunch of remedial training with them. So the biggest challenge, unfortunately, is that a lot of those design processes, and I know Chris was mentioning design thinking and so on, design thinking is a wonderful tool. It does not solve all the problem because it's missing something. When Chris is talking about the empathy portion, most of the design processes that engineers go through, and this is even with the bias stuff, what they've done is they are using a design process where they bring in people that speak for the trees, that is, are talking about the needs of different people, they never bring in the trees. Like the, the people that are actually the ones that they're trying to design the software to be. So this is where the biggest challenge is. People, the, the, if you are designing a process that is trying to eliminate bias, every person who could be subject to that bias should be part of your design process. That's, that's how to fix it. That's, that's the major need to fix it. And, and by the way, you brought up a great point. I want to just cement it. Technology is, not, technology is what's getting us into a lot of the challenges here. It is not going to solve it for us. There is no magical point where this is, you know, that, that this digital distraction machine is going to suddenly become perfect, where software is going to solve every single problem. It's just not going to happen. That's the rhetoric from Silicon Valley. Instead, we need to be thinking about how we continually bring the human element in. We are the champions for the human element. So the technology is in service to that and not the other way around. So, and with that, I think I'm, I'm out of time. So thanks a lot.